Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope that everyone's staying saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names to add to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24 seven during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names of the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service, we're continuing to pray for those things. And also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I uh, thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this. And most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So if you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys, we want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. Uh, if you guys missed the major announcements, please feel free to, to rewind to catch those. Remember sending praise reports, prayer requests, names to add to our prayer list at cljcrequests at gmail.com. As always, we're still asking everyone to continue and pray and fast for Zach Carter. Uh, today we're going to be continuing on with our Sunday School lessons. It's going to be Lesson 6, The Work of God. Focus thought is God's Word and Work must be our greatest priorities. Focus verses Haggai 1 and 14. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, y'all forgive me for my pronunciations today, governor of Judah, and the spirit and the excuse me, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Lesson text is Haggai 1, 2 through 14. Haggai 1, 2 through 14. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for ye, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when he brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all that labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of, jo of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we love you, to God. We praise you, God. We thank you for the opportunity to be down here. Thank you for the opportunity to, to, to teach your word, God, to get it out to the people. God, thank you again for your blessings in the church, keeping cancer out, keeping our soldiers safe, our travelers safe, our children safe. God, we're not worthy of all the blessings that you've done. You continue to bless us, God, and we thank you so much for what you've done. I ask you, God, to bless this service. God, use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Give me a word of knowledge and a, a word in season. God, let everything be your words. Don't let it be my words. Don't let me say too much and don't let me say too little. God, let this go out to your people and let them be faithful and watching these videos, God, to, to be faithful and, and being and hearing to your word, God, let them see that we need to get stirred up, that we need to be about your work, God, and put your word as a top priority in our life, God. We ask you, Lord, to, to touch all your saints, touch everyone in the church, God. Again, God, keep us united, keep us bound together, God, and keep us faithful in this time. We know we haven't been in the church, God. It's 42, 43 weeks, something like that, God. But please, God, keep your people united together as we once were before. And do whatever it takes to get rid of this fire so we can come back into the house, Lord, again, and worship together, Lord, without restrictions. I ask you, Lord, touch all those who are suffering with this disease, all those on the front lines with it, God, all those that are suffering, God, all those who have lost loved ones, God, move for them, comfort them, touch them, and heal them, Lord. Touch our nation, touch our leaders, God. Bring peace to our land because you know that we need it, God. Give you all the praise and the glory and honor for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Uh, the book starts off with a, a story of a construction project in Orlando. It was a man that owned a a religious TV station, uh, and he had a dream to build a building. Uh, he wanted something that could house offices and recording studios, things that would be used to broadcast shows and, and songs and everything like that with. Uh, and its name 
was the Majesty Tower. And that sounds like a pretty impressive building, the Majesty Tower. So he lined up some money for the buildings. He had the plans. He had everything lined out. And everything should have been good to go. 12 to 18 months is what he expected this building to go up in. And after that 12 to 18 months, it should be open for business. Now, but has anyone that's ever done construction, you've done anything to your homes, you've tried working on a vehicle, you quickly learn that things don't always go according to plan and life often sticks its nose into your business and causes delay and the chances are whatever your target finish date was is going to be way, way off base. <laughs> Excuse me. And so uh, there was delays in this project. Life happens as it does and he had the money to complete his plans, but he didn't bother considering the cost for any delays. Year after year that went by, the building still wasn't built. Locals cleverly named it the I-4 eyesore. Um, and so it began construction a couple years ago. They, they've started back up on it. Um, but again, they've now ran into more delays. Almost 20 years later, and almost $40 million, they financed it all with debt, and it still is not done yet. 20 years of idleness. You know, works left unfinished or projects that, that just sit idle, they often lead to ridicule and frustration from people. In our area, we have the King Cole Highway with its uh, bridge to nowhere there in Mercer County. It's been idle for years, leaving many people, you know, residents wondering why their tax money was even being spent on this thing if it's going to sit idle for so long. And Haggai, it details the progression of the rebuilding of the second temple. The foundation had been laid, but then the Persian king issues a command to halt the construction. Now the work that had been started was left open and exposed to the elements. In the book it says the foundation uh, laid exposed for around 15 years. It was not touched. Everyone was so excited to get the work done, but then one little hiccup gets in their way and everything grinds to a halt. It leads to work being postponed and work being forgotten and abandoned. Priorities of the people began to shift. And this is where God uses Haggai as a prophet to the people to get them stirred up to do the work of the Lord, to bring back to their minds the purpose and the importance of doing the work of God. They had neglected building the house of God. What was once top priority to them you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about, uh, you know, leaving your first love, losing track of what you originally were dead set on, your original goal of what you wanted to do. And now God sends Haggai to, to knock them upside the head a little bit to get them straight, to remind them of what their purpose really should be. If you recall, a few months back, we spent a, a lot of time learning about the kings of Israel and Judah, how the overall majority of the, the kings that ruled over them were wicked men. And, and when they were wicked, God would disperse the people or he would make them to be servants to other kingdoms. But when they would cry out to God and when they would change their ways, then God would hear their cry and he would come in to save the day every time, bringing them back to where they once were. It was an endless cycle that kind of just makes you shake your head. If you've read through the Bible at least one time, you know it's just a never-ending cycle. And if you study history, you, you really do see that it does often repeat itself, and that's what happened with the Jews. As, as soon as you see them being rescued, you know it's only going to be just a small matter of time before they go back to their wicked ways, before they begin to act like the world all over again. And each time the cycle would progress, it would get worse and worse, and it would grow more wicked and more wicked with each cycle. In Second Kings 21, 12 through 15, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out, came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. Since the day of Moses, they had been provoking God to anger. He parted the Red Sea. He brought them out with riches. They didn't even have to work for. He saved them from Pharaoh's army. He delivered them out of captivity. He did it all for them. And you would think walking across on dry land where a sea 
once was, you would think that would be enough for the people to walk the straight and narrow path. But us humans often have short, uh, short-term short memory loss and we forget the things that God does from time to time. But long, long after coming through all this, the murmurings and the complaining start, and then out comes the golden calf that brought them out of the desert, so they say, or out of Egypt, they say. <clears throat> God wanted them to possess the promised land. He said, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Live right before me, do as I say, and go and possess the land that I prepared for you. That's literally all they had to do was live right, walk before God, and everything was taken care of. <clears throat> but they lost sight of that. They became distracted. They took their eyes off the ultimate goal, and it ended up costing them dearly. The generation that he had freed out of Egypt, those were the ones that he wanted to go into the promised land. That generation was the one who was supposed to go into the promised land, but they ended up blowing it all to pieces. They didn't focus on what God wanted from them, and they lost their reward. Even after, uh, you know, finally taking the promised land, they continued to lose focus and, and continue on that roller coaster ride that they went on constantly up and constantly down. Finally, God has had enough of those scriptures we just read in 2 Kings. That was God's extreme judgment that he was executing on the people, excluding the last few years of his life when he turned things around. Manasseh is pretty much listed as the most wicked king that there was. He did a lot of bad stuff. Now, it's hard to pinpoint the exact year of when the Exodus was. Some scholars say it was in the 1300s, some say it was in the 1200s, some say it was in the 1100s. But you see, you know, there's not an a exact set date there. But from the time of the Exodus to Manasseh, it, it was a space of at least 500 years. God had seen his people turn to wickedness over that 500 years time and time and time again, and he, he was just finally sick of it. So he sends in Nebuchadnezzar, he levels the city, he levels the temple, he breaks down the walls, and he leads the people into captivity. The thing about it is, got to thank God, because he is a merciful God. And one day, he, again, he will look to his people, and he's told Jeremiah, he said, if they will turn back to me, he said, my anger will not be kindled forever against them. God is a forgiving and a merciful God. And so God stirred up Cyrus, king of Persia, to begin rebuilding the temple that was once in Jerusalem. And over time, Ezra and the boys, you know, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, everyone else, they began to make the journey back to rebuild. They faced opposition uh, of those surrounding them, constantly mocked, feeling pressure from all around them, from everyone in the world to give up. And, you know, some things never really changed for God's people. We still see those things happening today. And oh, it was a great day when they first started, when they got that foundation laid. Ezra 3, 10 and 11 says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites and the son of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever, forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. And when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house was like these people were excited because they just had the foundation of the house. Like they had the Levites all decked out. Everyone was dressed proper. Everyone had their specific instruments they were supposed to do. It was just like the old days. And Ezra says the sound was so great that people could hear it from afar off. They were having church that day. But we know where good is, evil is always lurking around just the corner. The new inhabitants of the lands, the one that had moved in when, when the Jews were carried off into captivity, they began to raise problems, they began to raise a stink, and they began to lie and spread false rumors against them. The king of Persia hears this and eventually shuts down production of building the temple. One obstacle got in their way, just one obstacle got in their way, and they just throw in the towel. They completely give up on it. And so they went from shouting and rejoicing and praising God now to just leaving a bare foundation, an unfinished building. building. Getting into the, the first chapter of Haggai, you know, there are no punches pulled in that book. That's Haggai 1, 2 through 4. It says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for ye, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? It's not time to build the temple. It's not time to do the work. And God's asking them, 
well, when is the right time to do that? He said, you dwell in your sealed houses. You had the time to build your own houses. You had the time to put your roof on to make sure you and your family members and all your materialistic things were covered up. You had time to do whatever you wanted. And while there was certainly time uh, enough to, to complete your works, when it came time to doing my works, you didn't seem to have any time. You always seemed to be a little bit too busy. Your house is nice and fine while my house lies and waste for over a decade uncovered, left out in the rain and exposed to the elements. In verses five and seven, twice he tells the people, consider your ways. You better check yourselves right now is what he's saying. You're neglecting the house of God and by doing that, you're neglecting the work of God. Haggai one and six says, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, <laughs> excuse me, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. You're, you're having hard times right now, people. You want to you know, know what you should do? Consider your ways. Examine your lives and see if your problem started the moment that you began neglecting the work of God. When your priorities began to change, is that when your problems first showed up? God tells him, he says, go to the mountain, get the wood, and build the house. He said, I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified in that house. Hey, God, one and I, if you could throw that up, JB. Uh, he was talking about, God said, you, you look for much, and it came to little. The things that, that when you brought something home, I blew on it. I scattered it. You didn't have anything. And that's verse 9. And so something interesting happens in that verse. You know, normally we see man asking God why. Why when something's going wrong, we, we sit there and cry and we say, why God, why is this happening to me? Well, here's an example of God answering us when we ask why. And you better be careful when you ask why because God, again, is not afraid to pull punches. He's like, well, why do you guys have these troubles? He said, because my house lies in waste, but you guys run to your own, to your own sealed houses. You took the time to build yours, but you left mine unfinished. Why is there a drought? Why is there no fruit? Why is there no corn? Why is there no new wine? Why am I touching your cattle, your laborers? Why is everything? Why? Because you've neglected the work of God. They neglected him. And so when you neglect God, that's when he begins to take your blessings away. So don't ever neglect the work of God. So now an adjustment had to be made by the people. Some of their priorities needed to be fixed, needed to be adjusted. And they went from serving God to serving themselves. Now some repentance had to be done and they had to make a turn back to God to where they once were. God said, build this house and I will be glorified. The prior, their priorities had shifted from something that glorified God to something that their own flesh had wanted. And as long as they were comfortable, that's all that mattered to them in that moment. And after years of problems, it doesn't seem they ever put two and two together until Haggai showed up. When you neglect, like I said, or you turn away from God and the work that he's called you to do, that's when your blessings are going to start drying up. The work of God and the word of God should be top priorities in our lives. We have to honor and we have to love God. And how do we do that? We, one way is following his word. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Listen to what I say and then do it. If we keep his word with us, it leads us and it guides us. And all the, the traps that the devil can even throw in our way, his word keeps us from falling into those snares, into those traps. And if your house isn't built upon the rock, if that foundation of your life is not built upon the word, then you're no different than the man that built his house on sand. All it takes is one little storm to come in and wash everything that you once had away. I was talking to uh, Jeff Hogue the other day uh, about my degree and, you know, I'm uh, pursuing a job that, that I'd like and uh, he's already in that cybersecurity field and so I began to talk about the aspects of it and he told me, he said, it's not a job where you do work in the evenings, but it's one where you're going to be doing a lot of reading and studying in the evenings and then he said, fall in love with the technology, I guess because it's the path that I've chosen and, you know, what's what I'm going to be surrounded by for the next 25 to 30 years, it's beneficial to me to love what I do and what I work with. And so if you're wanting to be on that path 
to heaven, then you better fall in love with the things of God. That includes his word and making it a priority in your life. If you do that, if it is a priority in your life, it's never going to steer you wrong, not even one time. But if you neglect it, that's when you're going to have your problems. That's what we saw in the Old Testament. All of Israel sinned. They didn't keep the commandments of God. In Jeremiah and Nehemiah, it says, your kings, the princes, the people, and even the priests themselves strayed away from God. Every person pretty much strayed away from God. The ones who were supposed to be the moral authorities, they even strayed away themselves. And Ezra 3, 12 through 13 says, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. That day everyone was excited, except the old men. The ones that had seen Solomon's temple, and one day talking about this, Thomas made a point that I, I'd never considered about, and uh, I'm going first today, so I'm going to get to steal that point. Thank you, Thomas. Oftentimes, people talk about the young men in the crowd, the rejoicing they, they experience over just seeing the foundation being built. But they don't know what the old men knew. They didn't experience what the old men did. The, uh, these young men, don't, they don't know the glory of the first temple. They don't know what things used to be like. Well, if the old men had been doing what they were supposed to, if they were living right and they were doing the work of God, then these young men wouldn't have to just be excited about a foundation. They would have the original work that God had set before them. And I never thought of that, that point before. But, you know, the Bible says a good man leaveth an inheritance for his children's children. Now, I've already received some of my inheritance on this earth that has a monetary value. But I'm thankful the pastor, you know, my papa, has given me something worth more than any gun, than any guitar, or any piece of land that he could give me. And that's showing me the importance of doing the work of God in the good times and the bad. My great-grandfather started this church. The pastor's been here for 40-plus years. He's poured into my parents and, and to others, and they've in turn poured into me. And now I'm re-pouring back into you guys and re-pouring back into my Sunday school class, into your children. I thank God every day that I was blessed to be born in a family that knows the importance of doing the work of God. Don't be like the Israelites. Don't keep sliding backwards, giving up on things uh, for God that you once stood on. You keep slacking. Like they slack, you're going to find yourself in the exact same shape that they did one day looking around where something great once stood, where something you could be proud of, and all that's left is an ash heap to look at, something that your kids and your grandkids have to go in and clear out with a bulldozer and then go and rebuild upon. You want your grandkids and your kids to experience church how you did it to feel what you feel, then stay focused on the word and the work of God and instill that in them. Let that be your inheritance to them. I know future generations are inheriting $28 trillion in national debt. It's, it's the least you older generations could do for us is to instill that love and the work of God in people. When they heard the word from the Lord, it says the people were stirred to action. They obeyed the word of the Lord and they feared the Lord. James 1, 22 through 25 says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. It's not enough to just listen and to hear the word, feeling excited and feeling those goosebumps and those chills go down your spine. We have to be doers. We have to actually act on the word of God. And if all I do is, is hear without ever acting on it, then I deceive my own self. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem till you be and do with power from on high. And then once you get that power, he said, go. And so he told them everything they needed. He gave them everything they needed, and then they went and acted. And that same word they got 
from Jesus is the same word that we have now. The same Holy Ghost, that same power that they received at Pentecost is the same Holy Ghost that we have now. And it's on us to be like the disciples and the apostles. It's on us to take that word and act and go. Hey, God, 2 and 3 says, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of, as, excuse me, of it as nothing? The old men that weep, the old men that remembered Solomon's temple, this foundation that is laid, it pales in comparison to the greatness and to the glory of what Solomon's temple was. When you look on this foundation, there's, there's doubt in you. You don't see anything great that can come of it. This little foundation here cannot compare it to what Solomon had. But one thing that's important, when you go to do the work of God, you always got to remember he's right there with you. And not one time when he calls you to do work is he going to leave you without the right tools and without favor. He's not going to leave you alone until that work is completed. Haggai 2, 6 through 9 says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold as mine saith the Lord of hosts, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. It don't look like much now. You can't see what I can see, but when I get through of it, with it, this last temple won't even compare to what Solomon has. It's going to be a greater house, just like with Nehemiah rebuilding the walls. It seems the people had a mind to work in just four years. It took them four years to complete this project. It laid in waste for 15 to 20 years, and they got to work, and they completed it within four years. They got to, down to business, and they continued with the work of God. And when you continue with the work of God, you can do things in a record amount of time. It also says that the Jews prospered through the prophecy of Haggai and Zechariah. Obedience to God and doing his work also brings blessings and favor from God. And again, God's work must be a priority in our lives. The book mentions an article, and it's a few years old. It's, it's from 2014, but it says in the study they did, the average American spends at least 20 hours a week watching TV. That's essentially enough hours to be working a part-time job. And I'd wager to say now, you know, in 2021, social media would give those uh, TV numbers a run for their money. When asked how much time they spend on religious activities on Sundays, the average came out to be of, of Americans to be about 30 minutes on a Sunday. A quote from the article says, Americans spend more time grooming themselves than they do praying or attending church. Right. And it's times like these that we're in right now that the church really should be standing out where we need to be about the work of God. We probably have more distractions now than at any time in history. Hours can be wasted on Netflix. Hours can be spent wrapped up in watching the news, you know, addictions of phones to social media, being a workaholic, being consumed by sports. The list goes on and on. You know, you can be consumed by hunting, fishing, shopping, gossiping, whatever it may be. These things can get in your life and become a distraction. So if you want to do the work of God, then we got to start slicing time out of our schedules to actually do the work of God. Like the Jews, they had focused on building their own houses. They had done what they wanted to do, and they neglected the work of God. We can't neglect the work of God because there are souls out there. There are people that are lost, people that we love out there who are lost, that if the Lord came back today or he called them back, they might not make it into heaven. And it's our job to be lights and witnesses to try and lead them back in to church. For us to be a light in this dark world, that's our true calling. That's our purpose, to help the ones that are, that are broken. You know, we can't do the work if we're caught up in ourselves or in things that distract us. Right. You know, or don't fall victim to easy distractions. I know with, I was voted biggest procrastinator in high school. I, Paul said, I'm chief of sinners. I, I'm chief of procrastinators. I'll get the work done, you know, but I'll get it done by the deadline, but that's it. And you can't be a procrastinator when it comes to doing the work of God, and thankfully God's instilled that. I didn't get the procrastination in doing the work of God, but you can't be distracted when it comes to doing the work of God because when you become distracted, then you're not focusing on the work of God, and you're not focused on the work of God, you've essentially neglected the work of God. There are 1,440 minutes in a day, and think about how you spend those minutes 
every day. Now we have to work, we have to sleep, we have to eat, there are things that we have to do. But in those idle hours, that free time that you have, how do you spend your time? Think about how you spend your time this week. Are you investing in the, in the things? Are you investing your time in doing the work of God? Or are you investing in yourselves or doing things that you want or just easily become distracted by whatever shining? If you guys have a smartphone, it may hurt you to look at, but those things are really, really good at keeping track of just how much time you spend on those things every day. It's hard on the flesh, but removing things that distract us and, and eat up our time, it's the best way we can stay focused on doing the work of God. If, if we decrease, if we get things of the world out of our lives, there's so much space in there, and the less there is of us and the less there is of the world, the more space God can take up. And so I'm closing right here. So this week, cut out some of those distractions. Right. Insert some prayer. Insert some, some fasting, some study in the Bible, witnessing to people, or just being kind to one another and, and checking in. on oh, well, I know I'm bad about that because I forget about things sometimes. It's not that I'm a bad person. It's just I say I'm like an elephant, but everything goes in this year and it goes out the other year, and then I got to do better, and everyone has to do better if we want to be doing the, God, the Lord's work. And so this week, remove things that eat up your time and start focusing on doing the work of God Amen. and make it a priority. Right, make man. the word of God a priority in your life and make the work of God right. a priority in your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we praise you, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you for the chance to do the work, God. God, thank you so much for the opportunity, God, to be lights and witnesses to the world. God, help us to get rid of these distractions, these things that bog us down, the things that eat up our time. God, help us not to be like the Israelites were focusing on our sealed houses while your work lays in waste, God. God, help us to put aside our works, God, and be focused on doing your works because there's souls out there. There's people, there's lost loved ones that we have, people in our own families that need salvation, people that have never even heard the truth and never even heard Acts 2.38 or how you loved us and you came for us. God, help us, God, to get rid of that junk that's in our lives and be focused on doing the work of God and sharing the word of God. Lord Jesus, God, let's bless this service. God, let it go out. Let, let it change someone's life. Let someone's heart be pricked. If all it does is change one person, God, we know we've accomplished our work this week. God, let it go out. Let your people be faithful in watching this in your church, God. Let it wake us up. God, stir us like you stirred the people back in that day. Lord Jesus, God, to be about your work, to do what you called us to do. Again, I, I thank you, God, for all your blessings, for keeping cancer out of the church, our travelers safe, our soldiers safe, our children safe. God, again, we're not worthy of you doing that for us, but you continue to do it because you love us, God, and we're forever thankful for that. God, bless the church. Bless your pastor. God, give him wisdom and knowledge in this time. God, speak that word of healing. Get rid of this virus, God. Do whatever it takes to where we can get back in church and gather together again without any restrictions. God, we give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Church, I love you. Hope everyone has a good week, and I really hope to see you soon.
you wash my sins away. Oh, now I'm living, cause I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. Oh, now I'm living, cause I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. Lord, you found me, you healed me, you called me from the grave. You gave me a real love, I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Now I'm living, cause I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. Thank you. 